case, I think it's time to get, it's time to get started. Um, it's good to be here. Uh, thanks for having us today. Uh, this presentation is about Ceph and OpenStack. Um, I'm Sebastian Hahn, and I work for Red Hat uh, as a senior cloud architect. So it's a really fuzzy name to say that I'm doing design uh, for cloud platforms, basically. Uh, from time to time, I do blogging as well. Uh, so it's a uh, self promotion here. And uh, yeah. I'm my name is Josh Lurgan. I've been working on Ceph for about five years now. I'm the technical lead for the block device portion. So uh, I'm more on the engineering side of things. Okay, so today's agenda. So for those of you who are not familiar with Ceph, we're going to go through Ceph well, really quickly, uh, just to, uh, to get uh, another view. Then uh, we're going to explain what's new in Ceph, uh, what's new in Liberty and beyond, uh, what's new in Ceph, and we're going to do some preview about what's going to happen into the Mitaka cycle. So as I said, for those of you who are not familiar with Ceph, uh, Ceph is a unified, distributed, replicated open source software defined storage solution. Uh, unified because it allows you to consume your data through several ways, uh, object, block, and file system, basically. Uh, it's distributed because of the architecture, so we don't have any single point of failure. We have just a bunch of machines. It's uh, replicated because we have uh, replication factors uh, of your data, and it's open source. So a little bit of background behind Ceph. Um, Ceph was supposed to, well, is supposed to scale horizontally. So we, we shouldn't have any single port of failure where you have this uh, single big server and you have all of your clients just uh, accessing that main server too. So it's definitely not, not how it works with Ceph. Um, the solution must be hardware agnostic and we have to run on community hardware. Uh, Ceph manage whatever is possible. Uh, so that means we, if something breaks, it has to repair. Uh, it's open source. And we really want to move beyond um, hold approaches like, uh, like client server. That, that's what I mentioned, where you have all of your clients accessing the same server. Now it's more client cluster, where you have access to the entire cluster, and then you can write on every single machine available. And we don't do any tricky thing with HA, so it's kind of built in into the Ceph components. Um, so a more general overview about Ceph. Uh, as you can see, Ceph is built upon Arados. So this is the, the main layer of Ceph where you just basically manage everything. It's, it's your object store, because in Ceph, everything is an object. So just on top of Ceph, we have a Librados, where you can just access your data, write your data to. Uh, so there are several bindings for, for several languages. So that means that you can simply build your own app and use the libraries to connect to your cluster and to write all of your data in it. But thankfully, we have something already uh, already ready for you if you want to do object store. So we have th the first one is Rados Gateway. It's the equivalent of Amazon S3 and OpenStack Swift, basically. So it's a RESTful gateway where you can just uh, HTTP RESTful interface. Uh, so it supports multi-tenancy uh, zones, uh, replication through zones. Then the second component is uh, RBD, uh, stands for Rados Block Device. And this, this piece is divided into two, where we have uh, the, um, the kernel driver. It's a little bit the equivalent of IceCuzy. So basically, you can create an image, and then you can map it to a host, and you can just write it. And the second part is the, um, the, virtu uh, the, the virtualization plugin for uh, QEMU and KVM. So that's what we use in OpenStack. And the latest part is CFFS, so it's the distributed file system. Um, yeah, so it's it's the, everything is <laughs> really stable. Everything is really robust uh, except CFFS for now. But uh, as Sage mentioned yesterday, this uh, the the first stable and production ready version of CFFS should appear uh, next year during Q Q1. So that's uh, really good news. A little bit about Rados and uh, the Ceph components. So we have monitors. Uh, these are the, let's say, the, the brain of your cluster. It's the entity that manages cluster maps, so the, the topology of your cluster. Uh, it does. Uh, it provides consensus. So we have a Chrome mechanism. But it's a Chrome-based mechanism, uh, and, and and that's why we need a, always an odd number for for your monitors too. It's done in a data path because when we, so when we want to access uh, our cluster, we don't just don't go through the monitors and then to the cluster. We just ask for our monitors to get the map. So we have the topology of the cluster, and then we can access all of the uh, machines. 
that hosts uh, object storage daemons. So this is pr basically one process, and is a, this process is just uh, bound to one disk. Uh, this this entity just basically writes data, replicates data, backfill whatever whatever it's needed, and uh, yeah. So it's the the entity that is managing your your data. So a little bit about Crush, uh, because Crush is definitely what makes Ceph so unique. Um, it's a pseudo-random placement uh, algorithm, which means that we, when 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 a client wants to write data, it doesn't do any lookup on any hashing table or anything like this. So every every single time he he wants to write data, uh, it has to compute the location. So we always know. Can we? In based on several uh, things, we can predict. Uh, where the data will go, and if something breaks, where the data will move. So, uh, so this is really flexible, and it's topology aware. So you can design things with rags, with data centers, uh, and uh, yeah. So Ceph in OpenStack. So, um, so this is the current state of the integration, basically. So we uh, we know how to work with every single component of OpenStack. Uh, for Keystone, you can. You can basically use Rados Gateway with uh, the Swift API. So you, you simply register uh, an endpoint into Keystone that points to your Rados Gateway. Uh, we currently support V2 for Keystone, uh, but um, since I believe V2 is going to be deprecated pretty soon, uh, we are currently working on uh, supporting V3. Uh, for Cinder, we use librbd, so we can just create devices and then attach them to virtual machines. Uh, for Glance, we also use uh, RBD, so we store um, OpenStack images uh, in, into uh, into Ceph. Uh, same goes for Nova. When you boot an instance, you can basically uh, have your root ephemeral disk living inside your Ceph cluster. So uh, we finally have this uh, unified layer where all of your OpenStack components are backed by the same storage entity, and which is which is kind of nice because there are several mechanisms that we use uh, to, to speed that up, and we're going to be discussing that a little bit uh, in a second. And I will uh, leave it for to Josh. Thanks, Sebastian. Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's been happening in uh, terms of OpenStack integration with Ceph and in Ceph itself. So we had a number of bugs fixed in Liberty. Um, I won't go through all these in too much detail, but fixing the throttling code in, in Nova to make the, that apply to ephemeral disks like it uh, w does for Cinder volumes. Um, a few th things to make Cinder itself more robust, retrying deletions when they failed in case it was a temporary condition, uh, making sure that uh, long-running RBD calls like deletes don't block the Cinder 8 volume thre uh, thread anymore, so you can have many deletes running in the background threads and it won't affect other operations. Uh, fixing up the clone dev options so that you can automatically um, flatten clones. You don't get a super long chain if you're cloning volumes to another volume and to another volume. And fixing up uh, config drives in Nova so that they can be stored in, in RBD directly instead of uh, needing to be stored on a, on a local disk. This is one of the steps towards uh, diskless compute nodes. There are also some other um, features and improvements in, in OpenStack and Liberty. Uh, one of the biggest ones was support for volume migration. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, there are several other smaller things. One is uh, being able to report whether we support discard or trim requests, which is what file systems or uh, block devices um, s send down to RBD or SSDs to say that they're not using this space anymore and the underlying storage can get rid of it. This isn't actually supported in Nova entirely yet, so it's not quite ready for, t for use, but it, it's on its way. Um, in Nova Glance and Cinder, we added uh, the ability to use the default uh, feature set for an, an RBD image um, based on your Ceph.conf settings. So this is, this is instead of hard coding it. Now that we're, so we've started adding more feature bits to RBD itself, um, you can get the latest things uh, and use them with, uh, without having to change OpenStack. And like I mentioned before, there's some more robustness fixes for Cinder, um, retrying on uh, if uh, the connection times out, and uh, trying all the locations for a glance image in case one of them is clonable but others are not. And finally, with uh, supporting multiple, cluster, multiple clusters in Cinder, uh, being able to pass the cluster name to some calls that didn't have it there before. That's more of a bug fix through. So that's kind of uh, the, the, uh, an overview of what's happening in, in Liberty. 
but let's talk a little bit more about uh, volume migration. So this is one of the larger features uh, in Cinder. This lets you copy a volume from any kind of Cinder backend to any other kind of Cinder backend. This might be from one pool in Ceph, perhaps from um, hard disks to a, a separate pool that has all SSDs if you want to improve the performance of, your, of a volume. Or you could be migrating it from one storage backend to another, for example, from LVM into Ceph. Now, right now, this mainly works uh, offline, so you can't do it while a guest is actually using the volume. But in the future, we're looking at uh, making it work more in the online case by uh, doing a little bit of uh, a few tricks through QMU. So the, the guest is actually aware, or the guest itself but is not aware, but QMU, the hypervisor, is aware of what's going on. So it can work while it's, it's in use. So let's talk a bit more about um, what's new in Ceph. We were just about to release the new Infernalis um, release. The RC went out, I think, last week or two weeks ago. And we're getting pretty close to the final release now. Uh, there are several new things on RVD itself. There is per image metadata. This lets you kind of associate arbitrary uh, strings of key value pairs that you can uh, with images. But it also lets you store persistent configuration options for RVD. So if you have um, images that are used for some kind of workload that benefits, for example, from a large cache size, you can store that cache size uh, in that image in the image metadata, and it'll be always be applied whenever the image is used. So you don't need to worry about um, kind of configuring cache size for across all images. You can specify it for Im individual ones instead. Um, one of the newer feature bits is called deep flattening. This lets you, uh, when you have a, an RBD image and you have created a clone of it, um, in the past you can flatten the clone, but if you had taken snapshots of that clone before flattening it, the snapshots would still reference the parent image. So with a deep flattening, um, when you do a flatten on the image that supports deep flatten, it'll actually flatten all the snapshots as well. So if you create a clone of, of, of a parent image, snapshot it a bunch of times, and then flatten it, there are no more references to the parent image, and you can just delete the parent image if there's no, nothing else using it. So this makes managing uh, clones and parents a bit, more, a bit simpler. Um, so one of the newer features in Hammer uh, was object map support for RBD. This keeps track of w which individual objects in an RBD image, which are usually striped in four megabyte chunks, uh, actually exist. So this allows us to speed up all kinds of operations, like uh, to IO to clones, we, since we can tell exactly which clone we need to read from, or deleting images which have like, almost no data in them. Also, uh, now in Infernalis, allows us to speed up um, differential snapshots. So we can keep track of which individual objects changed between snapshots and only uh, and generate the diff based on this, this small bit of object map metadata rather than going and reading the entire image or the entire snapshot. Another new uh, feature in Infernalis is enabling these new, new features like um, object map or flattening, deep flattening, or exclusive lock from Hammer on, on existing images. So you can take your pre-existing images that are um, you've been using with OpenStack, and you can go through and add these, all these new features to them uh, while the, um, not, not while they're actually in use, but at least um, without having to copy all the data. So the, fi the final thing that um, other map makes quite fast is being able to tell exactly um, how much space is used in a given image or snapshot. So since we're keeping track of which objects exist in a given snapshot and which ones change between different snapshots, we can very quickly tell you with the new rbddu command how much space a given snapshot or image uses without having to go and query anything else in the cluster, just this, this, this uh, object map metadata. And that might be used in the future as well um, for reporting back into OpenStack about how much space is actually used versus how much is that. Um, is uh, simply provisioned. There's also been more work on the on the um, baseline for RBD mirroring, which is the big multi-site feature we're working on for RBD. Um, we're not quite there yet, but it, there's more groundwork um, going in into Infernalis. So that's all. But most of the uh, RBD features in Infernalis. There's a whole bunch of other things in Ceph. I'll talk about a few of them here. Um, the Redis Gateway got support for the Swift API for object exploration. <laughs> I didn't know that was such a popular feature. That's great. All right. 
So yeah, um, objects can expire automatically from the gateway. They'll be garbage collected later, just like it handles garbage collection for other deleted objects. Um, there's a whole bunch of performance work that went to Infernalis. If you saw this uh, talks at the Slough Collaboration Day yesterday, you'll see that, that, that folks like Intel, Samsung, and SanDisk have been doing lots and lots of performance work, um, really improving the reads path, especially so far, and uh, making significant strides in the write path more recently. There's also been some work on the cache curing uh, capabilities of stuff to make that more efficient. So in Infernalis, uh, certain types of writes, like ones that are creating objects or appending to objects, can be proxied and that, um, to the, the base pool so that they don't need to promote objects into the base pool to write to them anymore. There's also, since uh, many, many dis distributions nowadays are switching to systemd, we finally uh, supported systemd and stuff and have those scripts available in Infernalis. Um, I think Trusty is still, still using Upstart, so Upstart scripts are still in Ceph3 as well. One of the other um, kind of uh, newer things in Ceph in general is erasure coding, and this, is a, this has a plugin architecture. So, so Shiba have been working on the uh, Shack erasure code, which gives you a slightly more space usage than standard erasure codes, but a much faster recovery in case of failures. Speaking of recovery, we have a lot better defaults in Infernalis for the recovery settings. Things like how many um, backfills are going on at once in OSDs, or how, or how much um, recovery is impacting client I.O. in general. The, the, these, the settings are much more appropriate for uh, default use. In the past, we found that uh, many, many people were changing these settings, so we just adopted what they were doing and made them the default. So that makes a lot more sense. There's still more work to be done um, in terms of uh, I.O. Pri prioritization. So in Infernalis, we have um, unified the queue between of I.O. that's going to from com coming from clients and handling internal tasks like recovery, uh, deleting old snapshots. Uh, and that allows us to more finely uh, balance the, the uh, storage performance usage between them. And in the future, we'll, we'll probably make this even more um, featureful and be able to possibly even have uh, some quality of service between different clients. And finally, uh, the one last thing I want to talk about that's new in Infernalis is the uh, improved uh, pool quota and uh, full cluster handling for the cluster. This is a bit of uh, just a general robustness. Uh, for the, uh, the, uh, when a, when a cl the cluster becomes full, it uh, stops accepting writes, and the clients will continue, will just simply wait for the cluster to become unfill before sending writes again. Um, in the past, there were some issues with uh, pool quotas in particular with RBD because the, cl uh, the storage cluster would actually send errors back, and the block layer doesn't like errors very much. It ends up turning your file systems read-only. So now the clients will simply wait and, block and resend once the, the pool quota um, is increased or other data is deleted. So let's talk a bit about the next step release, Joule. There are a whole bunch of th changes happening in Joule. Um, several big ticket features. I'll talk about a few now. So. One of the major ones for OpenStack uses, use cases is RBD mirroring, which I had mentioned a bit earlier. So this is asynchronous um, replication from one site to another. So rather than you, you, can have, you have one site perhaps with um, oh, three copies here, another site with uh, three copies, maybe only two, since you're not as worried about the data being lost there. But you can ha it's basically the idea is that you use this for disaster recovery. So you can have a con constantly streaming asynchronous replica of all your RBD images in a second site and flip over to using it, and all of your images will be in a, in a consistent state, even if they might require some um, system file system recovery, they'll be able to do that. There won't be any corruption, and th you don't have to deal with uh, things like uh, any scripts around shipping snapshots or anything like that. It'll just all be handled by a, a new RBD daemon, a mirroring daemon. Another aspect of uh, multi-site work that we're doing is to make the existing multi-site uh, uh, support for uh, are the Rebidos gateway, which currently uses a separate uh, Python agent script to do the synchronization, uh, easier to use. One, by redoing how we configure it to, uh, to make the configuration much simpler, and also putting the actual replication into the gateway itself, and also enabling it to re work in an active-active fashion, so that you can have be writing to multiple um, clusters with the Rebidos gateway and ac access your objects from anywhere. 
So the big uh, things in CephFS that uh, Sage was talking about a bit yesterday are the file system check and repair tools. These are the kind of last remaining pieces um, in CephFS before we're ready to declare it production ready. So these are what uh, folks have been working on very furiously. Uh, kind of a, a, an interesting thing that um, is kind of in the research phases now is doing more a quality of service based on different clients having different guarantees for I IOPS. For example, one client might be guaranteed to have 100 IOPS, another client might just be given best effort. Um, and, and that doing this in a way that is very scalable and works well in a distributed system like Ceph. So as watch, watch that space. There might be more interesting things coming out there. Probably not in Jewel, but perhaps a prototype or an experimental version. And maybe later in uh, the M release, we'll, we'll see that, or the L release, we'll see that become mo more of a possibility. Um, for a while now, you may have seen, if you've been using stuff, you may see that it uses many, many threads. And in fact, this number of threads increases with the number of OSDs you have and the number of, of connections that you make to those OSDs. And this is because of the way the, the uh, Ceph networking layer, or the messenger, uh, is written. So one of the things that um, is, prob is going to be, it improves that quite a bit, is an asynchronous messenger that uses a co constant size or uh, dynamically growing and shrinking thread pool rather than assigning its particular threads to particular connections. So that's been there for a little while now, but we're stabilizing it more, making sure it's more battle-hardened, and hopefully it'll be stable enough to use in Joule. It also tends to uh, improve performance a bit in certain cases, so it's, uh, hopefully it'll be end up being strictly better than Simple Messenger, the existing one. And of course, there are plenty of performance improvements going on. Um, many folks right now are fo still focusing on uh, right performance and um, Sage is redesigning the way that the OSD stores data on disk. Rather than going, um, going through a file system and a separate journal, for many operations we can actually avoid the journal and not have that double write penalty. And uh, there's more discussions about this ongoing and the whole design is kind of in a, bit, a little bit in flux, but it may even bypass the file system altogether and just get so we can get the full performance of the disk. Okay, thanks Josh. So uh, now we're going to go through the last part of the talk um, and give you some Mitaka preview. So if you if you follow me a little bit, uh, you you will know that I, I'm really excited about this feature. Uh, we basically call this Novi Firmware Snapshots uh, for uh, root devices. Um, the, the basic issue is that uh, when you take a snapshot uh, of your instance, um, it just uses uh, QEMU and then it scans all of the, of, all of all of the <coughs> sorry. Do it again. It scans the entire device, and it's stored locally on the hypervisor, and then it gets streamed into Glance. So basically, it's uh, a really long operation, and it's not really efficient as well. So the main problem was that when you run, let's say, a public cloud, or where you don't really control what's what is happening into your cloud, um, you might have several users uh, doing snapshots, and if you want to do diskless compute nodes, then you can't because you have to reserve a certain amount of space um, within your compute nodes just to save those snapshots before they get uploaded into Ceph. So with that feature, we don't need that anymore. And I will, I will go into some, some of the details in the, in the next slide. But uh, this is really something that we have been struggling a little bit to get into Nova. Uh, but now we have the spec and we have the code as well. So hopefully, and I hope, I really hope that this will get into uh, Mitaka because it's, this will, as I said, this will allow us to, to do diskless compute nodes uh, or at least a really tiny route uh, for, um, for, for, for your compute nodes. So if something is not configured properly though, you might have to, to use, to specify the snapshot directory path just, just in case. Uh, but Usually, if it's well configured, you shouldn't have to, to do this, but just uh, just in case. Uh, hopefully, you will be able to see everything, but um, um, so this is basically what's happening under the hood when you, uh, when you do a snapshot. Um, so what we do here is, instead of using QEMU and scanning the entire device, we do snapshots at the RBD level. So this also assumes that your instance is already living in Ceph, of course. Um, 
So, well, let's f um, fir first step, the user says, okay, Nova image create uh, of by VM. So then we begin the, the snapshotting process. Basically what's happening is that we create an RBD snapshot of that instance. Uh, we protect that snapshot because we have to clone it later. So we clone this snapshot, but we clone this in two glance. So the way it's configured, your instance is living into a specific pool, it's a Nova pool, and all of your images are stored into another pool. So what we do is we clone this, in this snapshot into the glance pool, and we flatten that image. So we d basically break the, the, the chain dependency with the parent. Um, in the meantime, well, when it's done, we just unprotect the snapshot uh, of, of the instance, and we remove the snapshot because we don't just don't need it anymore. And on the glance side, um, normal things, we just create a snapshot of that image and then we protect it. Because later, we, if you want to boot another image, we will have to create a new snapshot. This is one of the features that we use currently. It's copy and write cloning. So basically, when you boot an instance, uh, if the image is stored in glance, and if the backend configured in Nova is Ceph, uh, you just clone the glance image, and then this is your Nova instance. So this is really fast. Uh, so with this, with this uh, scenario, you don't really need to have any space available in, uh, on your compute node. And um, so this is really efficient and this is really fast. Okay, so some future OpenStack improvements. So that, that might happen in Tumitaka, but uh, not quite sure at the moment. We, uh, we would like to have the ability to attach several, uh, uh, the, the same volume to several instances. Uh, let's say you have a use case where you have an application that is not writing any data, but only reading data. You just have one volume with all of your data, and you could just attach that volume to all of your instances. Uh, but yeah, of course, you want the device in read-only. We want to optimize the volume migration, um, because at the moment, we, uh, we if, you, if your backend is, if you have two types configured, and then they're both Ceph, and they point to different pools. Uh, we don't really do uh, a direct copy uh, within Ceph. We, uh, we it's uh, it's file handler, so it's done in Python, and it's not well. It it, it works, but it's not as efficient as as it could be um, by directly using libraries. And um, so did we this is something that we want definitely want to improve. Um, when when we create an image from volume as from volumes as well. Uh, we we basically need a bunch of space uh, on 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 the Cinder node, and we don't really want that. And so, that's something that we have to work as well. Uh, thin provisioning reporting because uh, at the moment we just uh, if you create a Cinder volume for one gig, and then you get uh, one gig used. But uh, what we want to do is to have um, thin provision reporting, as I said, and we will just report the real space used by the uh, the block device instead of the entire space. Uh, we want to support force detach uh, for, let, let's say something crashed, and then we want to be able to detach the volume and reattach it to another instance. Onli uh, online volume migration from, from Ceph to Ceph, uh, that's what uh, Josh mentioned earlier. And uh, we want to enable uh, volume encryption with QMU. And yeah. One final word to say that uh, we w we won't um, we won't say this enough. Uh, if you want to configure Ceph with OpenStack, uh, this is the documentation that you have to use, and we highly it's always up to date with ev every single new OpenStack versions. Um, so definitely don't hesitate to have a look at that documentation, and that's the proper way to to configure your environment. So that's all we have now. Uh, thanks for your kind attention, and I think we have time. We have like yes, twelve minutes to uh, to get questions. Any question? Uh, I think we have the yeah, we have the mic. And, uh, so yeah. uh, do, 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 do. Don't know how to turn it on. Okay. I, I can repeat the question as well, or. I think this will likely happen next year, uh, but I, I don't have any much detail. I think it's uh, it's being done by someone from the community. Uh, maybe Neil, you know, a little bit more. 
Oh, the question was, uh, do we have a clear state of the of the integration of Keystone V3 with Redis Gateway? I know it's been working. Uh, okay, ready for Jewel. So the, not the next version, but the one after. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Just uh, quick. Okay. How much time it takes to flatten? Uh, well, it dip I think it depends on the size of the image. Uh, yeah, so uh, flattening yeah. involves actually copying all the data from the parent to make it independent entirely. So depending on the size of the image and how much data has changed since the, uh, the clone was made. Um, Yes. 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 Well, yes, but you d in the meantime, we don't really have the choice because uh, we c we c we can't really afford to have that uh, image still being a clone of of the snapshot, because that means that we can't really delete the instance anymore, or. So we really have to flatten that image, and so uh, about the time it will take, I don't, I don't really know, but it's just, yeah. just depends on the size. Can't it be done in the background? Or something? Or it, 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 it happens in in the background already, so it's it, uh, it's not a blocking operation anyway. Yeah, it's not. It doesn't so happen in the background, um, so oh. it won't block anything, mm. but it might take a little bit of time for the snapshot to become available to use. From user user perspective, <laughs> snapshot is immediate, right? So from a user's perspective, it's it's um, the, s the snapshot won't become actually available to use until the flatten is finished. So it takes a little, ho however long the flatten takes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Try the mic, please. I believe a lot of us would be having legacy hardware before mm -hmm. the cloud days. And suppose we have to migrate those legacy hard drives, say many SAS drives, 15K drives, okay, which are currently directly attached to the system using RAID controllers. Suppose we have to bring all those under the umbrella of Chef, okay, then how much overhead does the, the networking or the RBD protocol introduces? May, uh, question is, the, can it get at par, the performance level or the IOPS, can they get at par as direct attached storage? Or what extra hardware can be put in, in form of cache tearing or journaling, so that those old hardwares could, can get utilized in the, in the cloud ecosystem? Yes, you can use whatever hardware you want. And if the question is, how can I speed that up a little bit, uh, then you might have to consider using uh, SSDs for Ceph, for, Ceph, for your journals. Because basically, when you we use a journal, so every single write uh, gets gets through a journal, and then it's flushed back to the the file system. So if you have OSDs, you just configure the journal to be on on a, on, a, on an SSD, and then the the real the, the real what data are just on the uh, SAS disk. Okay. Uh, there was a particular test case published probably in the Ceph's website itself, which was about uh, migrating Postgres SQL into a Ceph uh, cluster. Mm -hmm. So that relational databases obviously uh, requires uh, too much of IOPS and uh, bandwidth. So there, uh, the final comment was that it was not up to the par. Of course, that was probably a year or two back. Yeah, so a year or two back, uh, SF's IOPS performance in general was much, much worse than it is today. So I think you want to try again today, and you'll see much more better, better performance there. Um, and depending on how many IOPS you need, you might actually want to go to a full SSD rather than suing separate SSD and legacy disks. Another thing that you can try, of course, is using some, th some kind of caching on the OSD itself, where you have an SSD used as a cache with a VE cache or DM cache, or one of these things, um, which helps, helps quite a bit for reworkloads, of course. Okay, so we could attempt uh, mixing up uh, SSDs and the legacy SAS hardware. Uh, the spinners, I mean. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's not like, ideal, but you can do it. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this is regarding uh, RD, RBD mirroring. Mm -hmm. So does it use snapshots in the background? Or no, so the way RBD mirroring works is it, um, it's going to be writing a journal of all the writes that come in and all the metadata changes for a given image mm -hmm. to a, a journal of radius objects. Um, that way we can have a consistent point in time um, no matter when, uh, as we're streaming it out, um, since we're keeping the rights in order, they're all, it's always a consistent state that the guest was actually in at some point. It was n it's not ever a, 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 an inconsistent state. So if you are doing a snapshot shifting approach, um, you always have periods of time where if you tried copying, um, you, can, uh, you would you, you have a, a periods between snapshots where you would, would have some kind of state that maybe not is not um, recoverable very easily from the, from the guest perspe perspective. I see. So you will be copying the journal. You are mirroring the journal and then replaying it on the remote side? Yeah, so we're just re replaying the journal on the remote side. How does it handle multiple, say, for a multiple volumes, for example? So each volume will have its own journal. A VM has two volumes. Yeah, and so how do you keep the order between the writes happening, you know? Yeah, so if you, have, if you have multiple volumes that are being used together, and you want to make sure that they are all... Um, you take care of it. Yeah, well, we don't take care of it yet. That's a feature called consistency groups, essentially, which is another part that we would add on once we were finished with the uh, basic mirroring. I see. I see. Okay. Thanks. Hey, do you know if um, uh, in Mitaka or another release, uh, there's the ability to configure the number of IO threads in um, Nova? I don't oh. I think it defaults well, to one. Well, this this is something that we also have been struggling for uh, about like a year or two to get. Uh, it, it's it's when you use the the, the uh, b b <coughs> sorry, uh, it's Brid Iscozy controller for QMU, and then you want to have more than one thread to do IOs. Uh, I don't I don't really have any visibility on that, but uh, I'd really like to to have it. I think there are th they were. There were two patches. One got abandoned, and not really sure about the state of the la last one. But uh, the way they want to do it is way too complex, I believe. Uh, but it's the way they do it in Nova. So, um, yeah, not sure if that's because I, f I think they they even did a spec for that. Uh, so you see how it goes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, first, thank you for changing the, the defaults for the recovery traffic oh, yeah. and rebalancing traffic. That was always driving me a little bit nuts. Yep. Uh, when I first set up my cluster, that was something I, uh, a problem I experienced was the defaults when I did a recovery um, took out my client traffic. But um, speaking of defaults, I know um, I've heard from, from several of my colleagues and myself that uh, turning off all the debug logging mm -hmm. uh, can give me substantial uh, performance improvements. Have you guys considered maybe uh, turning that down or turning turning those debug logs off by default? Yeah, I think we've thought about that a bit. Um, I, I think we probably m might want to consider doing that um, for Jewel, but we may also want to consider just making the debug logging more efficient in general so it doesn't have that much overhead because it's really useful to have those things if something does crash, right. uh, at least the in-memory logs so you can see what happened. Right. All right. Thank you. Sure. Is there any uh, expected data or something like that uh, for uh, persistent RPD caching? Yeah, there's some interest in persistent RPD caching. Um, some folks from Intel are interested in working on this. Um, first as a probably a, a single write back cache for a single guest and potentially in the future as a shared cache among uh, several guests. Okay, and something about uh, occupation uh, this usage on the journal? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, um, this usage on the journal. Yeah, um, how well far are from feeling uh, using the, the journal because the past we identified that the journal uh, get full and what we identified was uh, drops in the network. Something to monitor if the journal is size is is right or or something on that. Yeah. So they're talking asking about uh, the, jur the, the journal becoming full and. Uh, you see some kind of draft yeah. IO because we, we saw disk. spikes in in the network, and we thought yeah. it was because of the network, and actually it was because the the journal size was uh, smaller for 
So if you're seeing that kind of, those kind of spikes, generally you want to tune the, the way the, that the file store is um, sync, doing syncs. So it's either doing syncs uh, not, not often enough or not batching things up enough. Um, but in, in general, it's harder to avoid those kinds of spikes, um, even with tuning on, on hard disks than it is with SSDs, of course. Actually, the problem is uh, if the OSD journal gets uh, its fill, you will go at the uh, SAS or SATA disk drive uh, speed, so something to, to at least to have an idea or how are you working and what what would be the size the, of the journal that would fit for you? Something I don't know if, as far as I know, there is a way to know the the exact usage of the journal. Something like that would be interesting for yeah, for sizing and, and tuning. I think you don't really need that if from the get go you you're a little bit more generous in terms of the size of the journal. So this I think this problem can be solved really uh, easily if you just get uh, because there are just a couple of um, things to take into account, just like network speed and the speed of the drive. Yep. So if if you know that, you can you can just properly configure your journal anyway. So I, um, okay. I agree that, it, that this could be interesting, but I think it's uh, if you just configure like the proper size or <coughs> give a little bit more, uh, you shouldn't have that problem anymore. Yeah. So we solve it. Yeah. <laughs> more I, don't know. I know that you solve it, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, uh, I don't think I don't think we have much time, do we? Or, uh, no? All right, well, thank you guys very much. Okay, thank you.